Welcome to the Thunderbolts.info podcast for November 16th, 2012. We bring you all the latest news, information, and analysis from the electric universe, shedding new light on the many mysteries that dark theories have yet to illuminate. The broadcast that you're about to hear is a special impromptu discussion. And last night I came across a news story And right now we're paying very close attention to science news. And there's a story that has just run on sciencedaily.com based on a paper that's been published in the Astrophysical Journal. And I saw this and it just jumped out at me. We have to talk about this. And I had to get Wal Thornhill on the line to offer his analysis from the Electric Universe perspective. Now, astronomers are now reporting that they have in their minds, resolved a long-standing mystery involving a star called 49 Ceti in the constellation Cetus. Now, what makes this star mysterious is that, according to astronomers, it is supposedly 40 million years old, and a star of that age should not have a large quantity of gas still in its orbit. There's a large amount of carbon monoxide molecules, and this is a problem. Because with a star this old, the gas should have dissipated long ago. And the explanation that the astronomers are offering is that for 10 million years, an average of one cometary collision has been occurring once every six seconds. I'll read to you here a quote from one of the astronomers. He states, Hundreds of trillions of comets orbit around 49 Ceti and one other star whose age is about 30 million years. Imagine so many trillions of comets, each the size of the UCLA campus, approximately one mile in diameter, orbiting around 49 Ceti and bashing into one another. These young comets likely contain more carbon monoxide than typical comets in our solar system. When they collide, the carbon monoxide escapes as a gas. And the astronomer continues, I was absolutely amazed when we calculated this rapid rate. I would not have dreamt it in a million years. And I can think of at least one other person who probably would have never dreamt this in a million years. And that would be our very good friend, Wal Thornhill, the physicist from Australia, co-author of The Electric Universe, and the person that we go to when discussing these types of mysteries. Well, thank you for joining me here tonight. Oh, thanks, Michael. Now, I gave a little bit of an introduction explaining why this star had presented a little bit of a conundrum to astronomers, this mysterious cloud of gas surrounding the star. Why don't you go into some more depth as to why astronomers are going to these kinds of lengths to explain this mystery? Well, it's a mystery uh, simply because a star, after it's born, is supposed to blow away most of the lighter elements from uh, its surroundings. In other words, to clear the decks. In this case, the star is supposed to be 40 million years old, and yet it's still got this very heavy uh, disk of gas, carbon monoxide, surrounding it, according to their measurements. And they say, this is the oldest star we know of with so much gas. And there, now, there are only two of them out of hundreds of dusty disks around stars, but only two of them have been found that have large amounts of gas orbiting them. So, in my opinion, what they've seen is a star which has uh, recently ejected that material. But then again, there, there, the assumptions are just piled upon assumptions here in this article, and it's as if uh, one group of specialists uh, don't listen to another group because I've heard from an expert in uh, planetary formation theory that they have been unable to find how you accrete objects that will collide uh, bigger than a metre because uh, you have to get to about a metre in size before you have anything to work with to form planets out of a dusty disk. So right at the very beginning there's no answer to how you form planets and other objects including one mile uh, wide comets from a a disk of dust and gas. Right. There is no theory to uh, substantiate that. Well, you mentioned the layer upon layer of assumptions, and the first assumption, I guess, that they're working from is that the star is 40 million years old. Exactly. 
Now, for those who don't know, how is it that astronomers actually go about estimating the age of a star? Well, they base it uh, usually on the composition that they read from the, the spectrum of the star and various assumptions about uh, the, uh, the progression of a star from the time when it first lights up to when it begins to um, so-called burn hydrogen to helium and so on in its core and uh, also the material that it's made from. Uh, it's supposed to have accreted material that's been blown out by previous supernovas, so it'll have a certain amount of what they call um, uh, heavy elements uh, beyond hydrogen and helium. But the whole story is just that, it's a story. As the Electric Universe points out, you cannot tell the age of a star by its appearance because its appearance is a result of its environment. So the, the assumption that it's 40 million years old to begin with uh, is unsubstantiated. and. Uh, the fact that it has this gas surrounding it in a disk uh, more or less conforms to the electric universe model, which says that stars can and do uh, eject material and, and form the disks that we see around these hundreds of dusty disks around stars. It's the star that creates the uh, disk. It's not the disk that creates the star. That's very good, and I'd like to draw the viewer's attention to a Space News video I did with Wall about a month ago called The Impossible Star. And we discussed astronomers' observations of a star that they say should not exist. Based on the star's elemental composition, which is almost entirely hydrogen and helium, astronomers were led to believe that it was the oldest star they've ever observed, and the closest they've ever seen to the Big Bang in composition. However, it's a low mass star and its mass is low enough that the expectation is of astronomers that heavier elements are required to be present. So this throws into question the whole method of dating the age of a star. Now this story, which tells us that there are hundreds of trillions of comets orbiting around this star and another star, these comets one mile in diameter, a collision happening every six seconds for 10 million years. It's hard to even wrap your mind around these kinds of numbers. For laypersons like myself, why don't you explain for us what it is about these numbers that you find implausible? Well, uh, the astronomer Tom Van Flanden some years ago in his book, Dark Matter, Missing Planets and New Comets, pointed out that the volume of space you're talking about at the distances of Neptune and beyond from the Sun are so vast that even if you populated them with trillions of these so-called comets, the chances of them colliding are extremely low. And the point is, too, that this idea of collisions, which is a favourite one of astronomers to explain things uh, that are otherwise inexplicable, is that... Um, the speeds with which they collide in orbits at that distance are so small that you'd be unlikely to generate any uh, escaping gas. Or if you did it, it would be of insignificant amounts. And then you, again you come to the point is, uh, where does this carbon monoxide come from? It's just an assumption that uh, the comet's uh, full of this carbon monoxide, frozen carbon monoxide. Right. Now the whole question of comet formation that was really thrown into disarray with the Stardust mission in 2004. Mm -hmm. and, and we've seen some new theories or some new adjustments to theory. Some astronomers now suggest, I, I think this is kind of becoming the consensus that there's been some kind of grand migration that occurred uh, in the material that must have formed Cometville 2. You must have had material from the innermost regions of our solar system combined with material from the Kuiper belt. That's true. In fact, um, there's a problem with the composition of the planets, you know, let alone the comets. And uh, the, the problem is that uh, what has happened then is ad hoc additions to the old story about how the solar system formed are then made and to try and explain these things. But once again, they're just stories. The fact that there are the composition of uh, the stardust material was similar to that of the planets and also showed evidence of um, minerals that you find on the planets which require certain conditions like the availability of water or high temperatures uh, shows that comets are born from uh, planets 
and not co uh, planets born from cometary material, which is uh, the way that the astronomers view things at present. And then again, you've got these hot Jupiters that have been discovered around these distant stars. And uh, to have them in their position requires, on the standard theory, for them to have migrated inwards from the outer reaches of the planetary systems, simply because it's thought that you cannot have large planets form from the lighter gases, in other words, the gas giants, close into a star. Those light elements should all be blown away. But you get into problems there with the Earth. Why has the Earth got so many light elements uh, in its water and its atmosphere? Uh, that should have been blown away too. So you begin to realise that the whole thing is merely a story which has gained credence by endless repetition. And even the experts believe it uh, and look for confirmatory evidence or confirmatory bias, as they call it, so that uh, when something is discovered, like this uh, dusty disk full of carbon monoxide around a star, uh, then the standard uh, story is applied without any thought to the possibility that all of these anomalies require a different explanation. Are there just now too many layers of guesswork so that in questioning previous guesswork, it's not a matter of just taking a half step back or three quarters step back. You would have to take 10 steps back and question everything. No, that's too scary. That's looking over the precipice. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, I'm going to be posting two video responses to this that Thunderbolts has done. One is when planets gave birth to comets, which discusses the discovery that we just talked about, the Stardust mission, and of course, your very well-known predictions prior to the Deep Impact mission of 2005. Now, here's a question for you all. In all of the years that you have been following comet science, have you, have you come across anything that required an adjustment of your theory? No. In fact, uh, it was very easy. Within a day or so of the announcement of the uh, Deep Impact mission, I was able to write my predictions. So it didn't require a great deal of thought. And uh, they were generally, I think all of them were borne out, even though some of them were quite uh, uh, extraordinary. That's right. The 2011 Stardust Next mission, which again imaged the surface of Comet Temple 1, do, would you like to just make a brief statement about what uh, what the significance was of that re-imaging? Well, that was a, a great uh, opportunity to see the changes that had uh, taken place since the passage of that comet uh, around the sun and to see what sort of machining of the surface uh, had taken place. Now, I say machining, the general view uh, by astronomers is that uh, sublimation is what removes the surface material. But I specifically said that the machining would take place at the sharp edges of craters and, uh, and sc uh, scarps on the uh, surface of the comet. And that's precisely what was discovered. That's right. And in fact, wasn't there a very unusual comment uh, from one of the mission scientists about a crater? The, the problem was that not a clearly enough defined crater was left by the projectile crashing into Temple 1. It was felt that if it was crashing into a softer, looser surface, that there should have been a very clearly defined crater. And so the fact that Stardust Next mission, that they imaged uh, much less of a dramatic crater, they had to kind of stretch plausibility a bit to explain that. Yes, the uh, composition of the comet uh, changes to meet the observations. Um, according to the standard model. And in fact, uh, the next Stardust Next mission finally achieved what the original mission was, uh, that the Deep Impact mission was uh, meant to do, and that was to image the crater. And the crater did not live up to expectations, uh, which is another thing that I predicted. Right. And wasn't the explanation that uh, the ejected material must have somehow... Fallen back. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, the dust, it, it exploded up and out and then it fell back down. And the comet, of course, it, you've got, you're talking about one billionth or so the gravity that we have on Earth. That's right, yes. Just right. A, a small movement is enough to have you uh, achieve escape velocity. Right. Now, we're doing a shorter broadcast here tonight, but just some final thoughts on this story that we're looking at here. I mean, I'm looking at the words of the scientists in this case. 
in order to make this theory work, they have to, I mean, we're talking about the assumptions. Of course, they're assuming they know the age of the, of the star. They're assuming there are trillions of comets in orbit around two stars. And that these comets, for some reason, they contain more carbon monoxide than typical comets in our solar system. So it's, it is layer upon layer upon layer. That's right. I like the last uh, comment uh, that I was absolutely amazed when we calculated the rapid rate of uh, comet collisions. I wouldn't have dreamt it in a million years. Well, this is the problem with using uh, models because the models, uh, if they're wrong, they will give you crazy answers. So uh, yeah, <laughs> you just shouldn't accept an answer which you wouldn't dream in a million years. You should go back and look at all the assumptions. That's, that's a good line. If you would never dream it in a million years, why start now? <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Perhaps as a final thought here, this is just, this is something that I would like to get on the record. I know it is not your position, it is not the position of anyone in the Thunderbolts project that we're dealing with personal failings of scientists. It's not, it's not that we're going after the personal integrity necessarily of, of most scientists. I think it, it's more a matter of kind of institutionalized inertia or institutionalized habit. It's they're willing to, yes, sometimes they, they'll admit when they're wrong, when they don't understand something, but they're not willing to take the sufficient number of steps backward necessary in the face of surprising discoveries to really reassess the theory. That's right. Uh, I go to uh, meetings uh, by the Research School of Astrophysics here uh, in Canberra on a regular basis and I see PhD students presenting their work and it really is saddening to see that they have been trained to sing from the same song sheet and no other ideas are entertained. Um, they express surprise, um, puzzlement and all of those kinds of things which is one of the reasons I go because uh, they'll say things there that they won't put in print and uh, it's the story all the time there are puzzles all down the line but the public don't actually hear about them what they are presented with in the media are glossy uh, stories which are presented in um, as facts and they're not facts at all right well, while this was a lot of fun tonight, um, I would like to keep you busy. I mean, I know that you're already busy. Our audience, they love hearing your insights on these specific news stories. And so I hope we can do this again in the near future because we've got so much data, so much to talk about that has to be analyzed from the Electric Universe perspective. Yep. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, Wall. And I want to tell the listeners, uh, stay tuned to Wall's website, holoscience.com because he has a terrific and groundbreaking news article and analysis that he's going to be posting on his site in the near future. So thank you very much for listening to this abbreviated broadcast today and stay tuned to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Thunderbolts Project and our website, thunderbolts.info for all of the latest news on the electric universe. Thank you very much.